Ada Ava was one of the very first shows we started to make, and we began with the question of what kind of a story would work best in this medium of shadow puppetry. And we landed on the idea of identical twin sisters who live in a lighthouse and run the lighthouse. We thought that if you see identical twins in silhouette, there's already sort of a story being told. One of the sisters passes away, and for the rest of the story, we watch Ada cope with her loss and readjust her daily routine around the absence of her sister. I had recently lost my grandmother, and witnessing my grandfather adjust his daily routine around her absence provided the emotional fuel for Ada Ava. One night, a carnival comes to town and sets up shop right outside the lighthouse. Ada is drawn into the carnival and finds herself in a mirror maze where she discovers who she thinks is her lost twin sister. By the end of the story, she's discovered that she's gotten more than she bargained for. What we do is cinematic shadow puppetry. We have live music, live foley, and all the imagery is created live as well. And we started out a lot smaller where we didn't really reveal the process of how we were creating the imagery. And then as we started developing the medium, we started to flip the shows around to kind of reveal the chaos of how the images are created and share that with the final image of the show. Ada Ava is pretty influenced by Hitchcock's Vertigo, and also we got excited about the styles of the German Expressionist films, like The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari and Metropolis. Um, we added some more, you know, this kind of like horror element. During a manual cinema show, all of us are manning these old-school overhead projectors, combining a mix of paper shadow puppets with live actors performing in silhouette. Some of us came from theater, from music and visual art, and we never expected to do more than one little show with one single overhead projector. We just liked working together so much and we liked working with the medium of shadow puppetry and music so much. And before we knew it, uh, we sort of had this company. Manual Cine is a pretty collaborative group. We have five artistic directors and we all have a lot of different skill sets that we bring. We came together, kind of a visual team and, and a sound team. Julia Miller discovered uh, an overhead projector in her garage and decided she wanted to play with this, this medium of, of shadow puppets. We started performing in Chicago and it kind of blossomed from there. Our process begins with an outline of the story that we work pretty collaboratively on. 
The outline is storyboarded like an animated film. So we'll do kind of a rough and dirty puppetry sequence where we'll just film everything and edit it together. And then we try to figure out how to do that in real time. And a lot of the rehearsal process is just us trying to like do it fast enough. <laughs> We're really inspired by the constraints that our medium provides us. Our stories are told non-verbally, and that constraint has led to a lot of creativity and new ideas. We started to see the possibilities of um, using this medium with uh, cinematic language. Uh, things like scene changes and cuts and fades to uh, tell stories. Our first show, the audience really loved it, and uh, we decided to kind of continue. We began just doing pans and zooms, and when we figured out how to do rack focus, that was really exciting. Because the medium's pretty two-dimensional, so we're always trying to figure out through the puppetry how to add more depth. That's where a lot of the exciting innovations that we come up with um, happen. It's trying to figure out how to articulate that type of camera technique onto the projector. Some of the tricks in the show that are really impressive are actually the simplest. We had tried really hard to figure out how to make mirror puppets, creating all these super articulate, tiny mirrored puppets that had to be operated exactly at the same time. And they just weren't working. And then we realized that if you have two lights in different places shining at the same place, you automatically double your shadow because they're not coming from the same spot. So that was kind of when we had an aha moment of, oh, we can have two projectors up at the same time, but we just interchanged where they were showing light. I wish I had a puppet to show you. Resetting is really important because this is what the show looks like at the end. So resetting, you kind of go backwards and place them all in chronological order. And because we move so fast, if you don't have a puppet, where it should be, can be no good. Oh, here it is. So this is one part of a two-part mirror maze. So this will go on one projector, and then another slide that has black where the light is and cutouts where the black is goes in front of it. So the idea is that it's a whole, basically, hallway of rectangles. And then when you cross, it kind of transforms your silhouette. With our work, we really ask the audience to engage with the imagery and how it's being made because we're revealing the mechanism. Originally, when we were behind the screen, I feel like there was a, a little bit more casual energy because we weren't performing the show in front of the audience. They couldn't see us. And then when we flipped it around, I felt strangely exposed. We could feel the audience a lot more. We weren't like hidden behind the screen, so we were a lot more present in the room with them, which was really nice to kind of interact with them in that way. So we give the audience this different kind of agency where they're allowed to focus on either the mechanism of the show and how it's being created or the final product and just watch, you know, the movie version of the show. And I think that engagement is sometimes missing from live theater and film and bringing them together asks the audience to be present and participate. I studied theater in college and it was a pretty physical approach, like doing mask work and clown. And I moved to Chicago to work on shows, but I kind of stumbled onto a couple puppet companies. And it was just really exciting to me to see these inanimate objects, you know, come alive. So I started to work on a couple puppet projects and then suddenly it was just the only thing I was doing. Making puppets come alive is a combination, I feel like, of trying to figure out the breath of the puppet and what technically the motion is. It's a medium that's based in action and gesture, so 
Ideally, a puppet's pretty easy to use if it's designed well. It makes a proposal to you as what action it wants to do because that's what it's designed to do. And then you have to just kind of fill the action. There are about 300 shadow puppets and slides that go into the making of Ada Ava. And with the puppets, you have a very limited sort of palette of what you can express, but sort of taken together, you can build a very complex emotional scene. There's a puppet who can lift her head up and down or a puppet who can reach her hand out. And taken individually, these puppets are very limited, but strung together cinematically in a kind of montage, they can add up to quite a bit of storytelling. It's a good example of the kind of minute work that we have to do in this medium. This is probably one of the smallest puppets that we use over the course of the show. It's about a little less than an inch tall. And in this scene, the only action I have to do is walk the character Ada up the slope of the hill to her front door. She's just gotten rid of her sister's personal belongings. And all she has to do is kind of turn around and look back in doubt about what she's done and then make the final decision that, yes, she does actually want to throw away her sister's possessions and continue walking. And then the scene is over. It's a very short scene with a very simple rudimentary puppet. All the puppet can do is walk forward and backward and turn around. But with those simple gestures, you have to sort of convey a lot of emotional information. When we started integrating live actors, that was really exciting because humans can move so much quicker and do so many more things than the puppets. Puppets can only do one or two things max, um, but when you have a live actor, they can accomplish a lot more. So suddenly we had far shots and close-ups with the puppets, but then medium shots we could use live actors. Our storytelling is all visual and gesture. That is a great opportunity to create music that reflects the inner state of our characters. The music becomes a narrator. For the most part, contemporary film music is very much in the background. It's very subtle. It's kind of felt more than it's heard. And our shows are, you know, the music is a much more active participant in the storytelling. We're trying to create a soundscape and score. Our sound design is in four channels. Sounds really occupy all four speakers, and we really emphasize and exaggerate our sound design to make it more three-dimensional. what we're creating among the puppeteers and the musicians and all the technology and puppets we're using is a dance. We have to sort of feel each other all working together on telling the same story. It takes a lot of concentration and a lot of rehearsal and getting everyone kind of breathing together, breathing as one. When we're doing a good performance, you can feel that everyone is sort of on the same page and moving as a single organism. And when we get that feeling, it's the most rewarding, satisfying part of doing this work. 
We all have a lot of different skill sets that we bring. I feel like when I see the work, everyone, all the detail is there. Like there's so much thought put into every level from the sound design to the puppet design to the puppetry and the acting that I just feel like it allows us to have a more full-bodied piece of work because there are so many brains. One advantage of our work is that it's nonverbal. There's no language barrier. We were invited to uh, take Ada Evo to the Tehran International Theater Puppet Festival. Iran has a tradition of shadow puppetry and uh, theater and music that you know goes back um, you know, thousands of years and, and it's such a beautiful tradition. It was really amazing to, to take our work there and, and have it resonate with people. Initially when we came to New York, we were supposed to be doing a three week run of the show and then we got this really wonderful New York Times review. So we thought if we're already here, the show's here, you know, let's do it again and again and again. <laughs> And we ended up extending one week and then extending two more, so we actually doubled the length of doing the show. So yesterday was our 50th show of Ada Eva in New York. People like to describe the medium as lo-fi, hi-fi. You know, our tools are really simple. It's paper, it's plastic. We're not especially nostalgic for old technology or um, old films exclusively, but we're also using these overhead projectors which are, you know, 20 or 30 years old and aren't really a big part of people's lives anymore. But for us it's really about finding the things that excite us and finding the things that serve the storytelling. <laughs> 